one of the most amazing experiences of my life happened in March of 2021 when I was among the first to visit Sir Richard Branson's Necker Island in the British Virgin Islands at the tail end of COVID. Hi, I'm Park Howell and welcome to the Business of Story. I'll tell you that story in a moment as we explore how to create epic multi-sensory journeys your customers will not soon forget. Experiences they will gladly share with their friends and family to build your business. We have an expert with us today to show you how. Samantha Hardcastle is founder and creative director of The Storied Experience. She helps boutique restaurants around the world create mind-blowing experiences. But you don't have to be a hotelier to deploy her storytelling skills. All you have to do is muster your courage, untap your creativity, and let your hair down to build your business up. So Michelle and I had just moved into our new home in northern Arizona. It was a blustery winter Saturday morning when I received an urgent call about the need for a storytelling trainer for a bunch of automotive dealers who were gathering with Branson on his private island. In one week, I thought, how are we possibly going to get through all the COVID tests and follow the stringent pandemic protocol since we were the first group Branson was going to host since COVID had hit? Somehow we managed all of the hoops and found ourselves on Necker Island on the following Saturday. You may remember the TV show Fantasy Island. Well, this is the closest thing we had ever experienced to Fantasy Island. A private plane flew our party from Puerto Rico to Tortola, where we landed at 7 p.m. Two smartly dressed gentlemen ushered us onto a speedboat where they plied us with champagne and hors d'oeuvres as we raced through the islands on a 40-minute trip to Necker. An individual concierge greeted each couple. Welcome to Necker Island, Park and Michelle. Let me show you to the Great House, she said with a huge welcoming smile. When we finally arrived, it was late and they had asked what we wanted for dinner, assuring us that we could have anything we wanted. Anything. I won't even tell you what we ordered. When we spent five days with Richard on his island and I was sharing our Business of Story Mastery course with the 40 participants. Besides the remarkable staff, we were the only ones on the island with Branson and his wife. Michelle and I stayed in the great house. In it, they had these leather-bound notebooks. Branson asks all of his guests to share a story in the notebook about their experience on the island. The names of the people who had scribbled their stories down was a who-who of global icons. Michelle and I were absolutely blown away. But there was one piece of guidance he provided about telling your story. Branson didn't want a long-winded epic of your entire stay— he encouraged us to memorialize a particular moment that truly impacted us during our stay there. This was valuable storytelling insight for me because I realized then that most stories are not about some grand epic adventure. They're about remarkable small moments that change how you see the world, which can often feel unremarkable at the time. In our case, in this brief stay on his island, everything seemed remarkable. The setting the food, and mostly the people. This trip was a signature moment for Michelle and I in our lives, but we both had to boil our story down to a single moment on Necker. I'll show you what my moment was at the end of the show. Until then, I want to share with you how you can create peak experiences for your customers without having to be a global billionaire. In fact, the experiences you design can cost you next to nothing, but will be invaluable for the growth of your brand. By the way, Branson says that the most successful entrepreneurs are essentially storytellers, and there are lots of ways to share your story to deliver peak, unforgettable moments for your customers. I do believe that if you're able to zoom out onto your customer experience and look at the journey that they're going on and pinpoint those moments that are 
peak moments, right? Like we talk about peak moments and the, and the climax and a story. Those are the things you want to be looking out for within your journey. And if you're not finding them, you need to create them. Samantha Hardcastle supports visionary hospitality hosts in tourism attractions to create enriching experiences at the crossroads of culture and well-being. She dedicates her time to exploring the depths of experience design, developing ways to create activities and journeys that are immersive, revitalizing, and deeply impactful. The high-value experiences she conceptualizes are for guests who seek more than a visit. They desire a lasting connection with the destination, staying longer, spending more, and engaging meaningfully. I mean, who among us in running businesses and managing our brands wouldn't want that, right? But you don't have to operate a boutique hotel, attraction, or destination. Samantha will show you how to develop fresh spins on old customer experience concepts, create interactive environmental activations, and develop activities, programming, and retreats to provide peak moments for your customers. She even demonstrates her remarkable skills by sharing with you an experience she designed for Hakumba Hot Springs Resort a destination our daughter Corbin Winters and her business partners Melissa Struckel and Jeff Osborne spent the last three years renovating an hour east of San Diego just off of Interstate 17. So please welcome to the Business of Story a remarkable experienced designer, Samantha Hardcastle. Samantha, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to chat about this topic today. May I call you Sam? Yes, you may. It's a lot easier. And I've got a, a sister-in-law who is a Samantha, and she always goes by Sam, too. So it's naturally going to come bumbling out of my mouth. Anyways, glad we got that approved early on in the show. <laughs> so we are going to be talking about these multi-sensory experiences that you design. And I've seen some of your work. And I've been absolutely blown away by it. It is Your work is primarily around the hospitality industry and these really cool niche kind of resorts and places to stay. But can we use the same approach, the same sort of thing for all of our businesses, be it we're in B2B, B2C, whatever it might be? How can our listeners use what you are going to tell them today to apply it in their own world. Absolutely. B2C, B2B. Anytime you have a customer going on a journey, you have the opportunity to infuse it with story and create a journey that is more than just an interactive exchange of products or services and more making it more dynamic. So yes, we can get into that today. <laughs> <laughs> and you talk about story doing. How do you define story doing? Well, essentially, when most people think of story, they think of it as either a written or oral exchange of, of story. And there's so many more ways to tell stories. Story doing is essentially how I like to think of it is bringing the story to life in a really interactive and sensorial way. Uh, there's a great resource. If you search for story doing, Harvard Business Review did a really great article on it a few years ago, especially if you're in the B2B space. I think that's a great resource to check out. And, you know, story doing really is what we do every single day because our entire life is one big story playing out in little small scenes, big, you know, medium sized scenes and big epic journeys. So yeah. it's not, you're right. You, we always talk about storytelling and become a better storyteller and that sort of thing. And it, it makes sense in the business world because you're using storytelling to sell, to get people to your property in the first place. But story doing then is once they get there, once they are now interacting with your website or your company or whatever, is to give them an experience that creates a story that they want to share with other people. Exactly. I, I personally like to use the word journey more than I like to use the word story for that reason, because journey is essentially what all stories have in common. You know, there's a, a beginning and then there's an end and there's all the things that happen in between. And that's what makes a story worth telling. The journey aspect is something that I think we can all relate to. We're all, as you said, on our own journey 
Uh, we all have a personal narrative that we abide by. And so, yeah, I think it helps when instead of thinking about a story, which we're, is so ingrained in us to be something consumed, a journey is something to be lived. Well, let's show our listeners by opening up their theater of their mind. And I would love for you to describe one of these story journeys that you have designed and um, you may have already activated it or it may be in the process. Can you take us through one and, and, and paint the picture just as if we're going through it? <laughs> okay. Well, one of my most recent projects that I'm wrapping up right now, it's a hospitality destination in the Catskills. It's where fly fishing was born in, in the country. And so there's a lot of cultural expression around it. So what I noticed was there's a lot of hotels that allow you to go and do fly fishing through their property, but that's the kind of the extent of the association. And so I thought, okay, well, why don't we look into bringing this, not just the history to life, but like creating a story around it. I have a tendency to be a little whimsical in my approach and the more creative we can get with these experiences, the better. So what I conceptualized is a story from the perspective of the fly fishing lures, which if you've ever seen them, they're really funky looking. They have a lot of character and personality, which we're always looking for in, in character and story development, right? I wanted to kind of take people along the journey of the fly fishing lure. And, and because fly fishing can teach us a lot of different things. If you walk through this property, it's almost like you're being put into the shoes of a fly fishing lure. And so when you arrive, there are fly fishing lures hanging from above in the lobby, like hundreds and thousands of them just hanging from clear thread that you can hardly see. So they kind of, whenever you open and close the door, these lures will kind of dance in the wind. And as you check in, a story is, is handed to you. And that story kind of introduces this concept of, okay, you're no longer just going to sit by the pool and have a few cocktails today. We're going to take you on a journey of like, what is the essence of fly fishing? What is it about fly fishing that is so special and worth experiencing? It's a short story and it's not really intended to be something that is highly entertaining. It's really intended to send a message, which is everyone gets their chance to dance in the water, right? Like, so it's, there's heavy symbolism and there's this message that's basically saying like, if it feels like, you know, the waves are kind of passing you by in the water and things aren't going your way, that there's a chance that you're just in the ebbs and flows of life and that your opportunity to dance with the water will come next. There is this underlying message throughout the journey we're trying to convey, which is it's okay to go with the flow of life, right? Like how can we teach people through this story to embrace the ebbs and flows? And I'm going to be sharing a resource at the end of this that we can all, or maybe in the middle that we can all follow along with. If you sign up for that, you will be able to get access to this concept. So you can look at it in closer detail because there are some really unique aspects that we incorporated into the concept to bring this to life. For example, one of the hikes that we do for the property is halfway through, there's like a fly fishing lure tying station where, you know, it's kind of like a meditative craft activity. And then at the end of the hike, there's a life-size version of a fly fishing uh, net. When you're bouncing on that, it's kind of putting you in the shoes of what you might be experiencing in the water from that perspective of the lure. And so, you know, it's kind of reminding you about what it feels like to be weightless and in flow and just like that emotional appeal so that it, you're just constantly being reminded of this message throughout the journey. So Sam, I know a lot of fly fishermen and some of them are very serious. They're like academics when it comes to it. And heaven forbid you go out as a, as a novice like I have with some <laughs> of them and you screw up, you never get invited back again. I mean, they're so darn serious about it. How do you get them to care about this story? I mean, I, I, I was just hearing it. I love what you're doing there, but I picture my, my fly fishing buddy showing up and go, oh yeah, that's fine. Just where's the, where's the river? <laughs> Well, there's a few things that we need to consider here first. First is that 80% around there are, are women booking travel. So you have to consider that if 
they're attracting couples and it's the woman doing the booking. And it's maybe likely that the woman isn't necessarily a fly fishing freak, right? So we're trying to appeal to everyone, not just fly fishing aficionados who are extremists. And that was kind of a goal, which is like, how do we make this accessible? How do we not go into that extreme place of rigidity, which is kind of, again, what the whole point of the journey is trying to teach. In addition to that, like the other thing about story is like, if it's woven in nicely, some people are going to pay attention to it and some people aren't going to care. That's okay if people don't want to follow along with the story. It's just like any sort of information in life. If it's not appealing to you, we can't force people to take something from story. Right. But your job is to make it as whimsical as possible (laughs) and fun and surprising, I guess, really is what it ultimately comes down to, is how can we give them this memorable experience that they just weren't maybe expecting was going to be as, as, as deep in the story doing as you are designing for them. Yeah, exactly. And if we look at, again, these this archetype that you're kind of talking about that is like very serious, it's giving them a chance to experience fly fishing, like the concept, in a different way. Right. And novelty is so important when we talk about creating immersive experiences. Like if they experience fly fishing the same way every single time, then there's a chance that it, there's going to be a lack of presence and attention because they're on autopilot. And my goal is to take people off autopilot, especially with things that they're exposed to on a regular basis. We care about novelty and why novelty is important, not because it makes a great Instagram moment, which is nice, but it's not about that. It's about like, how do we use novelty to shake people up a little bit and and give them something that they're not used to? Yeah, and it helps differentiate the brand and makes the experience very, very memorable. And, of course, the Instagram moment is just added value. It's frosting mm-hmm. on the cake if they're now telling your story you know, on their channels and so forth. So how did you get into this line of work? Have you always been like an experienced aficionado, maybe mm-hmm. as a, a girl or young lady growing up, always looking for those real great dramatic experiences? <laughs> uh, no, not really. Um, so... I grew up in a very suburban New Jersey town where the only forms of entertainment were the mall and movie theaters. And I was really bored with both of those options. (laughs) And so, you know, I had to find ways to entertain myself, which, you know, thankfully I found through books and stories and, and television movies, but I was really missing those third places I was missing places where people could gather and actually do it in a way that was meaningful. So I went my, like, you know, my entire life, 18 years, just like in this incredibly boring suburban area. I mean, of course we were an hour and a half outside of New York city going to that, the city made me feel alive. Like it showed me what was possible. And then when I started traveling after college, I realized that there was this whole world of culture that I was not exposed to. And it made me want to consume as much as I could, like expose myself to a whole host of different cultural activities and people and their traditions and their rituals. The more I did that, the more I realized a lot of this is missing from at least here in the U.S. Like we're not always exposed to those unique cultural anecdotes and activities. And so I felt like, well, why aren't we doing this? Like, and how can I help? And my background actually is in marketing. So uh, I started a social media marketing agency in 2011. And so it was obviously already very immersed in the world of telling stories, albeit short stories on social media. And I was also simultaneously seeing businesses struggling with their experience development, right? Like I was working with hospitality properties, restaurants, tourism attractions, you know, they would come to me and they say, we're, we're ready to promote our business. And I would look at what they had to offer. And I would see, you know, it was a lot of the same thing their competitors were offering. So I saw this is not only an opportunity to have fun with the things that I was excited about, but help businesses break out from the mold that they were really stuck in. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And so what were you doing 
prior to starting your company that you've got now, the storied experience? Was it just the social media marketing? And yes, social what, media. What triggered you to get into it? Into experience design? Yeah. Uh, well, I have a very definitive moment. I was in Costa Rica and I, I stayed at two different hotels. One hotel was absolutely incredible, very luxury, very on the ball. They did everything right. And then I went to another hotel and that one just, everything that they have portrayed on social media was a lie. And it was not, you know, the paradise that they had painted a picture of. And I was sitting on my lounge chair and I was saying to my husband, I'm like, what can I do? Like, how can I help these businesses? You know, he was like, oh, well, why don't you go back for your MBA? And I was like, no, I really don't want to do that. And this was 2018. He did a quick Google search and he found that Cornell's hotel school had an experience design course. I have no idea what that is, but sign me up. <laughs> so six months later, after the course, there were a few threads that I got from that course that I followed. And I just, from there was able to really understand experience design a whole lot better. And one of those was the experience economy. That was the first time that it had been introduced to me. What is the experience economy? So the experience economy uh, was a book, I, I believe by Joe Pine. And he was basically the one who said that the 21st century was was going to be the shift from just consumerism based on products and, and whatnot and moving and shifting into experiences. And that's what I had been feeling. Like I was like, I'm done with stuff. I don't need more things. I was hungry for those experiences that I had, I had been deprived of all my life. And I really resonated with that. And and from there, you know, I really got involved with the Transformational Travel Council and I got involved with a whole other host of people who, again, were, were understanding that there was a great opportunity here for more than just uh, surface level experiences mm -hmm. and activities. You know, our kids are the same way. They range from ages 30 to early 40s. We've got three of them. And they don't drive fancy cars. And they don't. They live in nice houses, but not fancy houses. Yeah. And I guess, and they, and they wear nice clothes, but they're not like clothes hounds at all, any of them. No. And I asked them, you know, what do they do? What do they like? What would they like, you know, for Christmas and birthdays and things like that? And they're just like you. They said, we don't need stuff. We like to go do things. So mm -hmm. that's that experience economy that you're talking about. And they do. They invest in cool trips and cool outings and, you know, excursions and having that memorable time. Like last year, this time last year, I took our two boys, Parker and Caden, on the Grand Canyon. And mm. it was a seven-day river trip. We drove wow. into Marble Canyon, got in. It was marvelous. Helicoptered out, got on a little plane, flew back up the canyon, back up to where we were parked. And it was just one grand adventure. Yeah. And when you know Parker asked me, he goes like, Dad, what did this cost? Was it really expensive? And I told him it was like 2800 bucks a head. So it wasn't that bad, and yeah. he and you know that cut, that's all in. That's food. That's, that's everything. All you gotta bargain. do is bring your own booze, yeah. and you get everything else. And he said the same thing. He goes, "That is an incredible value." You think about if you're gonna go to Hawaii or whatever and get stuck in a Hilton over there, you know, it would be more like five grand ahead. And here you are out having this experience, you know, and yes. so. Yeah, your, your story around the fly fishing one, then we're going to jump into one um, that you've designed for Hakumba Hot Springs that, is, that I read for the very first time yesterday and absolutely loved it. So all you <laughs> listeners out there, hold tight. Why and how can people not inside the hospitality, I can't say that word, hospitality <laughs> world this morning today for whatever reason, how can they use these insights that you share um, to be able to bring that same sort of experiential design and thinking and activation and story doing to, you know, say they're a business to business for it. Say they're a SaaS company and they're selling yeah. software, you know, online. Can this work for them too? That's a good question. I mean, it's going to be less powerful. That's for sure. Because when you have an interactive relationship with a person in like a physical presence, there's obviously a dynamic that is, a, is quite different. But what I would say is that if you have a customer journey, which we all do, right, there is an opportunity to not just tell a story, to really 
bring that story to life. And, you know, that might look like interacting with your customers in different ways. You might find that there's opportunities to create interactive meetings with your, with your customers. You might find that uh, the website is less about the product and more about how you want them to feel with the product. Obviously, my specialty is hospitality and tourism, but I do have a background in working with a lot of different kinds of businesses over the years. So I would say the most important thing is what you're doing offline is going to play a key role in this. And I don't think enough businesses, especially in the online space, especially, you know, tech and SaaS, there's an opportunity for them, especially to take things offline. And, you know, I never really understood why businesses that offer service don't take things offline and create experiences for their guests. But I, I imagine that that's a big trend that will, if it's not already underway, will start to become underway. Well, Sam, I think you can do that online as well. And you had said it earlier, I think the two most important words that people could be thinking about to inspire them is novelty and surprise. How can you, in that customer experience on your website, how can it be somewhat novel? For instance, go if you get a chance, go and look at my about section on the business of story. Don't have to do it right now. But it's not your traditional about section. It's not your serious, here's all the wonderful things I've done. It literally starts with a picture of me in a onesie pajama <laughs> holding a box of, of Twinkles cereal when I was probably about four years old, waving to my dad as he's driving off to work. And that is the beginning of the story. And then it goes on and it takes people on my journey. Now, yeah. I'm not pounding my chest that it's the most wonderful thing in the world, but it is novel and it is surprising to people. Some people push back and say, that's just not professional, Park. And I go, what's not professional about it? I am taking you on my journey and whether you want to go, you don't have to go on. It's totally up to you. But there are lots of things you could do online and even in that SaaS product. You know, yeah. obviously business efficiency is probably going to be your number one thing, but how can you co people along that journey and surprise them so yeah. it becomes memorable and it becomes fun you know in the process yeah especially if you have the resources and access to create really cool user experiences online like if that's your specialty you could really do anything these days i mean and you can create i mean i've seen a lot of fun interactive uh, apps being created that are almost like an extension of what you're promoting, right? Like you might be promoting a product and then you've created some sort of supportive tool. And that's an opportunity there, I believe, to create some really fun storytelling opportunities, support the guest journey in a more positive way. Yeah, I saw that. You were just talking about that. It just popped in my mind. And I think it's for Excedrin. Um, and it, they were talking about migraines and how Excedrin is very effective for migraines and how a lot of people that don't suffer from migraines kind of poo-poo them. They're like, <laughs> oh, really? Can it really be that bad and whatever? So they did something interesting, and they created an interactive experience where someone that does not have migraines is sitting with her friend, in this case, that does. And the lady that didn't have migraines, they had them put on virtual reality goggles, and they had them plugged into the sensory audio going on. And they dialed up the vertigo that happens and the noise and the ringing in the ears. Mm -hmm. And they tried to make it, make her experience it, what her you know, girlfriend experiences with the migraine as much as they possibly can, could, as close as, as they could. And she was blown away from the experience. So they did that live. I mean, people could see it. But then, of course, they videotaped it and they put it on the website and fed it out through social media to demonstrate story doing, in this case, about what it feels like to have a migraine. And their whole mission was simply to get people to build more empathy, empathy. towards yeah. their friends, love, and family members that have mm -hmm. migraines. And oh, by the way, Excedrin is here on the sideline helping you get through it. And I thought that was a really brilliant, brilliant little, you know, experiential story, story doing. Exactly. And, and so that they took one of their values and they took one of their pain points and they brought it to life. That's why I said, like, I want to see more of that 
taking it offline, that sensory interactiveness, to me, it's just a hundred times more powerful than an experience online. That's not to say it's not possible to, to have that effect online. You could mm -hmm. obviously have a video of something like that. But yeah, I, I do believe that if you're able to zoom out onto your guest experience, onto your customer experience and look at the journey that they're going on and pinpoint those moments that are peak moments, right? Like we talk about peak moment, peak moments in the, in the climax and a story. Those are the things you want to be looking out for within your journey. And if you're not finding them, you need to create them. Now, in your process, I believe you use elements of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey in your experience design. Can you walk us quickly through that? And then let's talk about how you applied it to that spec creative <laughs> you developed for Hakumba Hot Springs. Absolutely. Uh, so I don't ever just follow one framework. I'm a big fan of taking little things from every framework that I've ever seen and kind of bringing my everything together into a melting pot like uh, Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, I think that it applies very well to travel. I think a lot of people go on trips hoping that the trip is going to do something for them. And essentially what you have is when someone's at home, uh, there's a call to adventure, right? Like something in their life is off. Something's not feeling great. Maybe it's boredom. Maybe it's stress and they're stuck in status quo. Right. When they leave and they finally get out and they book a vacation or they book a, a trip or they find a product that supports them, that's when they're, they're crossing, crossing the threshold and the, uh, the journey is actually really beginning. What I believe and I, I try to focus on is who are the allies? Who are the people? Who are the things? I don't just see allies as, as people. I believe that symbols and tangible objects can also be allies, which we'll talk about in a moment. You know, how are these people and these things supporting people on their journey? And what are the challenges they're going to be coming up against? I mean, I've said this so many times before, and I don't think it's really ever landed for a lot of people in the industry. Challenge is a good thing. Like when you think of hospitality and leisure, you don't want to challenge people, right? Like this is a time of leisure. This is a time of relaxation. This is a time of decompressing. We can't throw a challenge at people, right? Because they want to enjoy their time. Well, that's not necessarily always the case, especially if you want to create something that is has peak moments because you can't have highs without a little lows, right? So I am always exploring what is the potential challenge that we want to address with this journey and how are the allies supporting them in that? I like to take them as building blocks for my process. And it really helps create something. If you don't have this sort of framework, if you don't have this information, you have really nothing to go off of. You might be going off of something like, okay, well, how do we entertain people? That is the standard for hospitality is how do we, how do we entertain? And that's always been the question. I want to challenge our industry to ask a different question, which is, you know, how do we enrich people's lives? And I think that's the great potential within it. Obviously, what the the hero's journey helps kind of suss out. They really are. I mean, anytime you go on a vacation, it is essentially a hero's journey because you're leading leaving your ordinary world. You've mm -hmm. had this call to adventure of let's go to Hawaii. <laughs> Woo okay. And then you have the refusal of the call. Well, I, can we really afford it? Can I really take time off from work? I don't know. I'm so stressed out. Precisely. That's why we should go to Hawaii. <laughs> so then you depart, you leave your ordinary world, you go to the extraordinary world of the islands, and it's so beautiful over there. I love it over there. And then, to your point, you can go to highs and lows. You know, you can go to the to top of Mount Kil uh, what is it, Wailea, I can't even think of the name. I was going to say Kilimanjaro, wrong continent. Um, <laughs> You know, and then you've got the valleys and you've got everything in between and you've got the rigor of getting there. And then yeah. you finally settle in and then something goes haywire with your Airbnb and you get that fixed. And it all becomes a part of the journey and the story when you return home with the boon, as Campbell would say, you're now refreshed. Mm -hmm. You've been leveled up a little bit, maybe on Hawaiian culture, maybe on how to make the ideal Mai Tai. I don't know <laughs> what it is, but now you're refreshed and you return home. So it 
is, in every sense, a hero's journey. The way Campbell had mapped it out is just because it is the map of life. It's what we do, right? So let's talk about a bit of a hero's journey. I'm going to take you to Hakamba Hot Springs and the, the journey that our daughter Corbin Winters has been on. And by the way, this show is edited in Hakamba Hot Springs by our son, Caden Howell. <laughs> he works there as their event manager and does their audios for their staging and that kind of thing. They have a lot of entertainment that comes through there. So, But what Hakamba Hot Springs is, and and folks, what I asked when I talked to Samantha earlier, by the way, I want to give a big shout out to Paul Zach, who introduced us. And so we had a nice conversation when she told uh, told me what she did. And I said, okay, let's do a hypothetical. And let me introduce you to Hakumba Hot Springs, who, Sam, you did not know of. I mean, you're on the East Coast, and it is out in San Diego County, right on the border. I call it, it's where Schitt's Creek meets Lonesome Dove, the intersection of Schitt's Creek and Lonesome Dove. And our, our daughter was in the event planning business, and they, she and her business partner, Melissa, uh, they had this company called Pow Wow in San Diego, and they did all these unbelievable weddings out like in Yosemite and out Joshua Tree and on the coast. And they would bring in all the furniture and help design the experience. Of course, COVID hits, shuts that down completely. And uh, it was, I think, in June of 2020, right in the heart of COVID, uh, Melissa got out of town, went out to Hakumba Hot Springs in their little restaurant there, and the place was in decay. Now, this was a hopping thriving little resort town with these all you know natural hot mineral water springs that feed their pools that Hollywood elite would go to back in the 50s. You know, again, right down on the border, but it was on Highway 80. And then they put in Interstate 8, which bypassed it by three miles. And we all know what happens in America when your little wonderful enclave gets bypassed by an interstate, it fell into decline. And she was in there at uh, the restaurant looking around saying, this place is marvelous. It's just almost dead, you know, and finds out that it is for sale. And so they, she and Corbin got together with one of their customers, one of their clients, uh, Jeff Osborne, who uh, was the financier of it and all in. And he came down, saw it, said, let's do it. They bought it. They spent three years untold millions of dollars of, uh, to renovate it. And to me, the best way that I can explain is kind of like this Moroccan style retreat. They've got 20 rooms in the original hotel, two gigantic uh, pools there fed by the mineral hot springs. They've got a little lake that they reclaimed. They've bought several homes within Hakumba Hot Springs because when they bought the resort, they ended up with, I think, 150 acres, which was the majority of the town as well. So they also bought other homes that they've turned into Airbnbs. They've got an old bathhouse that they do concerts in. Um, They've even bought the the little mountain behind it. I think that's another 70 acres. Glamping will eventually go in. They've got a marvelous restaurant. They got an incredible pirate hideaway bar is the best way to, to describe it. And they opened in on February, full-time, um, February 14th, Valentine's Day this year. They made the cover of San Diego Magazine just prior to that opening. Sunset Magazine did a, did a little segment on them. And the New York Times just did a little segment on them. And Sam, they are now booked out months in advance. And so they will be building an additional hotel there uh, with a, with its own pool too, just to be able to handle the demand. But they have been so busy just getting it built out and getting it up and running and the hiring of their 80 or so <laughs> employees there that their marketing has really come down to primarily guests coming in and experiencing it and then sharing it on Instagram and social and so forth. They do have a a good PR person that is getting them some articles here and there. And I think maybe they're doing some paid advertising on Facebook and, and LinkedIn maybe. I'm not really sure. I'm not that involved in it, but it has just kind of grown organically. And so now everyone's got the backstory on it. Mm-hmm. This was the same backstory I gave to Sam, and I sent her the links to the website, hakumba.com, G-A-C-U-M-B-A.com, and the articles that were written. And then you pulled together a real remarkable spec creative experience that they could 
pull off there at Hakumba. So with that, and by the way, she uh, Sam put together this really terrific PDF on her proposal. We have a link to that in the show notes. So if you want, you could pause right now, folks, go and download it, open it up, and Sam is going to walk us through her experience design for Hakumba Hot Springs. Yeah, well, I just want to say I am so blown away and impressed by what your daughter has created and the, and the team have created. I mean, I am a huge advocate for these little places outside cities, uh, especially ones that have kind of died off. I think that the revival and regeneration of them is so important, uh, especially ones that have such a cool history as as Jacum- I, Jacumba. Yeah, everybody okay. gets that wrong, and I've had it wrong for the longest time. And I've got it's ha come ba J A C ha, and then it. I used to say umba, but it's umba ha come ba. And by the way, it's for the the rest of you out there. It's about an hour and fifteen minutes east of San Diego, just before you go down into Imperial Valley right off the eight. And it's like five minutes off the eight. Everyone has seen that exit sign forever, the Hakumba exit. Next time you're driving by, go down and at least have, you know, a bite to eat. It is so beautiful. It's so delicious. You'll love it. It it really is incredible. And so, you know, my process, which is outlined in the PDF that I've shared, is essentially the process I work through with most properties and experiences. There are a few instances where I deviate from this, I wanted to honor the sense of place and the destination. This is the process I took it through. Occasionally I will work with a property that wants to create their own world. And, you know, this gets into world building and we're doing less research and less honoring of the local heritage and culture, more of creating something new and and crazy, which is a, a little bit of a different process, but this is the kind of process that I took us through for Yakumba. So uh, if you want, I could walk through kind of each yeah. step. Let's do it. Okay, great. So the first step essentially is taking inventory. Uh, we want to familiarize with backstory, history, and recurring themes. A lot of the articles and the resources that I was able to find, they kept having some recurring themes. And obviously the, there are hot springs. So water was a, a massive theme that I wanted to work with. And the words that kept coming up when people described Yakumba were, you know, Matt. It's one, one more, ha. Ha Kumba. Sorry. I know. And you're you're not alone. Everyone gets that. I just want to make sure Hukumba. that everyone hears Thank it right. Yeah. Ha. Put an H there. Ha Kumba. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, the themes were that it was an otherworldly place, that it was a magical place. It seemed like, at least from from my perspective, that there was a desire to lean into a narrative around healing and revitalization, which is present in multiple layers in this whole process, right? So that's step one is just do a really deep dive into all the things that a, a place and its people can teach us. From there, it's about asking why these things are important, right? Like stories are all about conveying a message. A lot of times when people focus on story, they're just focusing on a re- retelling of history and not necessarily what the message or the lesson is. And again, I had no interaction with anyone on the team. So I was just doing pure research and kind of diving into this cold. But what I sensed from some of the things that I had read was that helping people become more present was a big goal of theirs. And I really love human behavior. I love understanding psychology. So I started asking myself, what is presence going to lead to? Why is presence a good thing? Why should I care about becoming more present? Well, presence can lead to a lot of things like being able to connect better with people. It can be more connection to ourselves and our creativity and our imagination. So that was sort of uh, the underlying lesson that I wanted to make sure was imparted. Then we dive deeper into the destination. And this is when I got into the stories and the lore and all the different things around the destination. There's a great video uh, on their website that kind of shows like the vibe of Hakumba. It's just this really quirky place, uh, a little bit trippy and just something 
I, I think otherworldly is really one of the best words to describe it. It's it's so in fact they have a UFO repair <laughs> shop, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. And these are things that you don't, you know, find everywhere. Right. So I wanted to lean in and honor that aspect of it. Like I felt like it was really important to bring in a lot of that quirkiness and, you know, especially when you're going into a place that has kind of been uh, dead for a while or for a period of time, but it has a rich heritage you want to honor that heritage and you want to find ways to bring it to life. I think a massive problem in hospitality is you get a lot of developers coming into places. They bring the same generic properties that are all over the world and you start to degrade the sense of place. If you don't honor the, the local culture and heritage, most of the time it's just going to feel empty. So to me, these stories and the lore and the unique aspects are what unlock potential narratives and stories for the hospitality property. So from there, it's all about taking what you've kind of amassed over your entire research span and sorting it into different piles, right? Like some of the stuff isn't going to work together. Uh, you know, I would have loved to do more to honor the Hollywood connection. But to me, you know, it was kind of just not jiving with some of the other things that I had that I did want to focus on. You were smart about that because I've been there several times. Of course, I've been there from day one to when they, you know, build it, my wife and I have, and to, you know, we've stayed there several times now and they don't really play off that Hollywood vibe because that's not what they're about. They are, they're about everything you're talking about at the, the local tribes and the, the, you know, the Hispanic culture that comes through there. I mean, they are right on the border there. And so it is again, for lack of a better term, more of like this really amazing Moroccan retreat and they're not playing off the Hollywood card at all. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of got that sense, but you know, I also, it's a lot of, usually this process I'm working obviously one-on-one -on -one with the hotelier and we're working closely together. This is a fun experience because it was just me just kind of in my own creative world, not, need, not really being influenced by too many outside factors, except for just my, the pure research that I was doing. I think they did go in the right direction. And then you want to start laying out the building blocks. And this is kind of what we talked about earlier. The story building blocks to me are a lot of those aspects of the hero's journey. What is the call to adventure? Well, there's a lot of reasons that people travel, but in, there's also not a lot of reasons. There's, it's a lot of the same thing. Like people are feeling stuck. Maybe people are feeling withdrawn, disengaged from their life. Your call to adventure needs to fit with the journey that you're creating. The journey in itself is a process. So to me, I leaned heavily into the water as an ally and a mentor. Water for many people is something that plays a huge role in their healing, a huge role in lessons. But then I also really felt like I could not ignore that the local artists in this region were just integral to the destination and creating this vibe. So I kind of went in both directions. I said, you know, in this journey, these are the things and the, and the people who are going to support them on their, on their path. What, what are the obstacles that are getting in the way of going from stagnant, stuck, disengaged to maybe more imaginative, more open and tapping into that inner sense of direction? Because I think when we looked at the destination, the people who were here and the people that I was able to find stories on in the destination were people who, in spite of like everything, were doing things their own way, who felt really passionate about creativity. So the goal is like, how do we create a journey that uses water in a way to connect people with their, their creative power? If you ever look up water symbolism, it's very heavily symbolic of creative power. And we'll get into that in a moment. But at the end of the day, journeys are difficult, right? It's not like you just go from feeling stuck and stagnant to feeling creative and imaginative in like a heartbeat, right? Like it takes effort, especially, you know, what Paul Zak teach us, teaches us about neuroscience is like repetition is important and that we need to have experiences that are really potent 
to kind of get us unstuck from our re- recurring and, and habitual behaviors. And so we're looking at how do we create activities and experiences that are those potent, you know, ones that are really high in oxytocin and dopamine to get people unstuck and onto the path. So the last and final step is bring the story to life. And this is obviously where a lot of creativity comes in. The story that struck me most was the indigenous people of this region, they have a different story of the origin of our world, right? And and most indigenous tribes and, and populations have their own story about how the earth was created. So they have their own story. And you can read this in the PDF. I'm not going to go through it all right now. But essentially, the world was all water to them before it, what it, it is what it is now. And that they had two brothers who came and created the world. It's actually interesting. There's a few different versions of the story. But one of them says that they came up through Hakumba. You have essentially Hakumba is the origin point of this creation. We kind of leaned into that as the story, as the narrative, and wanted to convey, like, how could you become your cre- your own creator? How can you learn from the people who, who have become creators in their own life? How could you learn from them? And how could you cleanse yourself with the water of some of the collective things that keep people stuck, right? The rules and regulations of, of our collective. Like, how do you release those? And, and water is a very cleansing tool to do that. So um, I can kind of walk you through real quickly. You know, I don't want to go too into the actual experience, but essentially the journey is when you arrive, it's so important when you create an arrival, cutting people off from the previous world. Like you're, there's a clear line that people are crossing that says, okay, now the journey has begun. And you're crossing the threshold. Yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. When I work with clients, like sometimes we go really big and create, touch points that are a bit more luxury and the build out is a bit bigger. Sometimes it's, it could be something like a piece of paper uh, and it could be something really simple, but I, I kind of went big on this and I, I wanted to conceptualize a fountain, like a cylindrical fountain with a golden orb in the center that people would reach into and pull out one of five hand carved desert obsidian symbols. And each symbol represents a path. So essentially what you're doing is you're setting them up on a journey, whether or not they want to go on it is up to them, right? If people want to hang out by the pool all day and not do anything, that's their prerogative. The thing about story is you're giving people a, a choice to opt in if they want to. The goal is to not make story so blatantly obvious and, and gimmicky that it's hard to ignore for those people who don't want to opt in. You want it to be subtle and you can't make it too subtle though, because if it's too subtle and then no one's, no one really understands or gets it. So there's really a fine balance to uh, walk here. Okay. In two minutes, take us through the journey. So I only gave one example of the five different journeys that you could go on because obviously this is (laughs) quite a bit of work, but essentially one of the first options is if you pull out a serpent snake symbol, then it would take you on a hike. And that hike would lead you to a mural of a snake, which just happens to be in this area. You'll see in the in the deck where it says, been riding so long, singing the same old song. And so we're the message essentially is like, we're trying to get people to wake up and sing a new song. So we're challenging people to do things a little differently. Because you know, hiking is a common thing people do uh, during their vacations, and there's very lack of engagement, interactiveness. So that's one challenge that we kind of present to them. And if they do this challenge, then... And by the way, that snake is on that desert lookout tower, right? That that it actually exists out there, and they go on like a scavenger hunt and they find it, and that is then the next trigger in their journey. Yes, exactly. So obviously, uh, I did some research. There's a place called Desert View Tower, not far from the hotel, and somewhere on around the area, I'm not ex- exactly sure where because I have not been, is a, a hut with a snake mural. And 
the clues that kind of lead people to the snake creates a, a trigger for the next part, which is finding um, a stash of instruments and a, a song that is commissioned by a local artist to sing a new song. And that's essentially what we want to do. The, the challenge, what we're really trying to do is get people to behave and interact differently than they're used to and do something that they wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable doing on a hike. The, the whole goal of the journey is to get them, shake them up, right? Get them a little, push them a little outside of their comfort zone. And those are the, these are the challenges we're presenting, right? Like if you were looking at this, reading this in a book, like looking at it from a journey perspective, this would be one of those peaks, right? This would be, you know, one of those storyline peaks that is building towards the crescendo. Well, and I like the crescendo that you have them build to when they come back to that uh, desert pirate bar, for lack of a better term, and they have their quest. They're on a quest and they bring back the boon, as Campbell would say, and in this case, it's a song. But they also then get a chance to build community and talk to other visitors right. that have taken different quests. And you you bring them all back to the resort and into the bar for a cocktail or they could go to a restaurant, but then they can share their journey and what they've done. Yeah, exactly. Like the whole goal is to get them interacting with other people so they can so much of like sharing stories, right? Like at the end of the day, we all share stories around the campfire your story is going to shift something in someone else and hearing their story is going to shift something in you. Of course, we all know that that's a huge power of, of story, which is really nice because like you're, you're trying to get people to not just hear other people's stories, but you want them to stay longer. That's a huge goal in hospitality. Oftentimes you only get people staying one or two nights. If people know that there are five other adventures waiting for them, or four other adventures that they could partake in, you know, they might extend their stay or, you know, if it's possible or, or they come you back, gotta give them a reason to come back. <laughs> yeah. So it's, there's always a goal. Like this is not just about creativity. Like obviously yeah. this is a business. We're trying to get people to stay longer, spend more, um, and give people a reason. Well, and you're providing them a novel, surprising experience. And in your write-up, too, and folks, again, go to the show notes and download it. You can see the whole thing. Um, Sam has also put in to that this whole art fair thing that happens long after your stay to keep people coming back and really to build community around Hakumba and celebrate the community that is already there, the full-time residents and artists and so forth. So it's, it's really remarkable. It was so much fun to read through all that. Sam, this has been great. I've taken up a lot of your time today. And so, I, number one, thank you for being here. And number two, where can people learn more about you and see your work in action? Yeah, of course. Uh, the Storied Experience Dot com is where I have a lot of resources, including articles and free trainings, uh, so they can go there. Uh, they could also go to wereverie.com to learn more about a tool that I have that is using storyboarding and journey mapping to kind of make the process just a little easier for everyone. And that's an app, right? Yes, that it's an online tool. You just sit tool. down and it helps kind of guide you through it. Yes. Yeah. That is so cool. Well, thank you, Sam, so much for being here. And uh, and thank you for bringing your talent and your wisdom to Hakumba Hot Springs. I can't wait to share th your story with them. And who knows, maybe uh, maybe they'll bring you out and put you to work out Yeah, there. I would love to visit. It looks like an incredible <laughs> destination. And I'm sure they're going to have their hands full over the next few years bringing it to life. But I'm, I'm really blown away by what they've created. Oh, well, thank you very much. And thanks so much for being here on The Business of Story. Thanks, Park. It was great meeting you. So what was my moment on Necker Island that blew me away? Well, it wasn't the Hobie Cat sailing, the hidden beaches hosted by sea tortoises, or is it tortai, <laughs> the sensational banquets, the private tennis exhibition Branson hosted, or the mind-boggling vistas from the Rotunda House where I hosted my storytelling training. Nope, it was during the last evening on the island. Michelle and I were having a margarita as the sunset turned the sky to a sort of cantaloupe, strawberry, blueberry colored scene. 
To make it even more surreal, a flock of 20 pink flamingos flew in formation around the point of the island and over our balcony. That's when I knew Necker was indeed Fantasy Island. Thanks for listening and sharing this show with anyone you know who would benefit by creating peak experiences for their customers. And thank you, Caden Howell, for editing our show right there in Hakumba Hot Springs. To Marissa Hill, who is always creating peak moments for our followers, and to Darius Holbert, who produced our memorable music. If I can help you and your people grow as more confident and persuasive storytellers to grow your business, your career, and share peak moments from your life, please reach out. And as you grow as a more compelling storyteller, remember that the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make that one epic. Thanks so much for listening.